Please arise for the reading of the sermon text. Grace, mercy, and peace are ours from God our Father, and the suffering servant, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. My sermon text for this evening, for this series of Jesus Christ is our great high priest, taken from the New Testament, the letter to the Hebrews, the fifth chapter, verses seven through nine, I'll be reading from the Evangelical Heritage Version translation. In the days of his flesh, he offered prayers and pleas with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was the son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. After he was brought to his goal, he became the source of eternal salvation for everyone who obeys him. These are the words of our God. Congregation may be seated. Dear friends in Christ, can good be too good? Can a person, a group, a thing just be too good for us? Some connected with the WIAA at least think so. Now, the WIAA is that organization within the state of Wisconsin that handles, perhaps among other things, but definitely handles the high school sports situation. And it's under WIAA rules that there's various uh, divisions for sports team in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, and these uh, divisions are usually based upon enrollment at schools. So, for example, a Division V school would be a smaller enrollment and be playing against other schools of smaller enrollment than a Division II school. And you'd think normally, well, that's the way it should work out. But there's been a proposal, it wasn't accepted according to the newspapers about a month or so ago, but there's been a proposal, and it might not have been the first time, a proposal brought to the WIAA to move certain teams up a division. If they were uh, a small school at Division 6, to move them up to play teams Division 5, Division 5 to Division 4. And they might have been teams that were from rural areas and they were smaller schools just because they're rural era areas. Or they might have been um, independent private schools. But the reason that some had wanted to move them up a division is that in their history of their sports programs, and it could be guys or gal sports, they were just too good. That some of these teams had built up su such a powerhouse at their schools over the years that they just kept on winning and winning and beating everybody in their smaller divisions. So the proposal was move them up a division and that would be more competitive. Now that proposal didn't go through, at least for now, but people got thinking about that. And if you think that that's just a unique Wisconsin thing, uh, when we were looking at the service materials from the Synod that are provided that you can get helps and hints and use whatever you want from it or use none of it, um, on this uh, series of Jesus is our great high priest, the pre-printed sermon that was for my uh, sermon had an introduction, a pastor wrote out an introduction about a girls basketball team in Minnesota that in essence, I guess, was kicked out of its division because nobody in its division wanted to play it. It was just that good, and they kept on beating everybody badly, and nobody wanted to play them. They were just too good. Can it happen that something is so good that it's almost too good? And the case in point here, bringing it back to Scripture, is we know that Jesus is perfect. He is the sinless Son of God, true God and true man. And yet, can that absolute perfection of Christ 
be such an overwhelming, terrifying, off-putting thing for us as sinful human beings. The writer to the Hebrews didn't think so, and neither do we. We continue this series of midweek Lenten sermons and and, uh, readings and such under the theme of Jesus is our great high priest, and we're going to take a look this evening on how, yes, Jesus is perfect. He is our perfect high priest, but that perfection attracts us. He is perfect in the way he approached his priesthood. He is also perfect in the way that he fulfilled his priesthood. Now in our Lutheran circles, we normally don't talk about the clergy as being priests. We talk about ourselves as being pastors. What do you expect in the personality of your pastors, your called workers, your vicar for that matter? What, if I were sitting in the pew and one of you, what would I expect from my pastor, my vicar? Well, I would expect kind of a a, a balance, if you will, a a reverence, a, a dignity. I would expect that called worker not to be so kind of stuck up with himself that he's just completely unapproachable, but I wouldn't want him to be some sort of good old boy slapping me behind the back all the time. I, I, I'd expect a balance there, kind of a calmness, kind of a, a, a friendliness, but not chummy. And in the language that he'd be using, I would expect my pastor, my vicar, not to be speaking in such highfalutin theological terminology that I couldn't figure out what he's saying. But on the other hand, I wouldn't want him to Um, have such uh, common slang, gutter language that it's undignified. You would kind of want your pastor, your vicar, your called workers to to be even keeled. Now that's normally the way we think of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, right? But not always. Not in Lent. And not here with our sermon text. The writer to the Hebrews says that in the days of his flesh, Jesus Christ in in his earthly ministry, Jesus offered prayers and pleas with loud cries and tears. This was a savior, this is a savior, a high priest that takes his priesthood very, very seriously, even emotionally at times. In the Passion History readings, maybe last week, maybe the week before, heard about Jesus there praying in the Garden of Gethsemane and the intensity of his prayer to his heavenly Father. Is there any other way of doing this? Is there any way of taking this cup from me? The intensity of his prayer was such that his sweat was as drops of blood. And when he goes the way of the cross... And when he's up there in pain and in agony, and you'd think the life and the energy just kind of ebbing out of him, he's loud. At times he's loud. He cries in his heart language, if you will, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then at the end, when he's there ready to die, He doesn't do it quietly. The Bible tells us, he says, with a loud voice, he said to his heavenly Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Our perfect high priest approaches his priesthood emotionally. He's all in with it. He wasn't somebody who came to this earth and to punch some sort of uh, heavenly time clock, and after 33, 34 some years, up, oh, did my duty back up into heaven. He's not the, the sort of person that we see, and, and I like following the Dilbert comics of, of the Wally that always seemed to work hard at not working at his job. This is a Savior that is all in, in what he came to accomplish. And our text tells us he was heard because of his reverence. When he had to, he could be emotional. When he had to, 
he could be forceful. When he had to, he could offer prayers and pleas with loud cries and tears. And he's still reverent. This is serious stuff that he came to do and to accomplish. And when we think of the times that we approach our God in prayer, in worship, and we think about the way that we approach the time that we spend, say, this evening in worship. Do we take it seriously? Is it the sort of thing, okay, I've got that hour to put in, okay, midweek service, it's Lent, yeah, I should really go. Do we approach the Savior that we hear about and speak about in the response of Passion History readings as, as kind of a, a buddy or a friend? Or do we take his priesthood seriously for us? Oh, yeah. If anything else, as I'm thinking about it uh, this year in particular, as we go through the Passion History readings and such, there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of emotion taking place in a few short hours. Think about the noise taking place in the temple. When Judas Iscariot, who had betrayed Jesus, somehow kind of realizes what he has done, and and he's trying to to set it right and and to reverse it all, and the chief priests and teachers of the law are basically saying, buddy, that's your problem. And think of the noise in the temple as Judas took that money, that blood money, and whipped it back into the temple. Think of the noise of those coins clinking the temple floor. And think of the noise of a St. Peter. A Peter who's more guts than sense, that's Peter. A Peter who said to his Savior on Maundy Thursday evening, I'm going to stick with you, I'm going to fight for you, I'm willing to die for you. And he was willing to put his uh, actions where his mouth was when he's swinging a sword. But a Peter then who would deny his Lord Jesus three times before the rooster crowed twice. And a Peter who wept bitterly. There's noise. There's emotion in the Passion History story. But Judas's didn't do us any good. Peter's as an example, maybe, but his emotion, his weeping, didn't accomplish anything for our soul's salvation. That's why we turn to Jesus. Our perfect high priest, as we see his perfection in how he fulfilled his priesthood. Although he was the son, the son of God, he learned, learned by experience, obedience from the things he suffered. He came to fulfill his priesthood in part by obedience. Now, our sinful world just doesn't like that, that, that whole concept of, of obedience, of doing what somebody else tells you to do, uh, perhaps even more nowadays, that this whole thing that, that that's a, an, a patriarchal thing, that's an oppressive thing, that, that's a power struggle thing. And because you've got to get along in this sinful world, yeah, you're tempted, I'll, I'll do what he tells me to do, but... I'm going to get something out of this. I'll do what she tells me to do, but I'm going to make her suffer. It's kind of like the, the child that has to do the dishes because mom says you've got to do the dishes. It's part of your chores. But the obedience is there, and it's groaning, and it's painful, and the dish really isn't washed that well, and it isn't dried that well, um, and, and it's like they're making you suffer along with their o- obedience. Like such a horrible thing. Not for our Savior. His perfect obedience. When he prayed to his heavenly Father, Is there any other way of doing this than me going the way of the cross? Can this cup be taken from me? Remember his words, not my will, but yours be done. And he followed his father's will. 
he went out there then in the Garden of Gethsemane and met his captives and made sure that they, uh, his captors, and made sure that they would know who he was. He would take on the scorn and the shame and the scourging and the spikes. And by doing so, he would fulfill his priesthood perfectly. After he was brought to his goal, he became the source of eternal salvation for everyone who obeys him. Now maybe you're kind of wondering at this point, okay, you know, the theme is perfect high priest, and I'm not seeing the word perfect here in, in your text, Pastor. Well, the translation that I'm using here, a newer translation, is translating the term in the Greek, he was brought to his goal. And you might remember that very same term being translated in other good translations as after he was perfect, after he was perfected. Interesting term in the Greek. It means all of that. It means perfect more in the sense of you've accomplished what you're supposed to do. You, you, you've come to the end, your, your goal is, is set, you've done what you set out to accomplish. This very same root of the word in Greek was the word that would be used, they discovered this, um, of Greek bills that were written around the time of Christ, uh, you know, a receipt for something that you bought, or a bill that you owed to somebody. And if you had paid up the bill, the word that they wrote in the Greek for, in essence, paid in full, is the very same root of the word that we have here, brought to his goal, perfected. And it's the very same root of a word that Jesus set up on the cross. Some of his last words, when he's out there, and it's as if he's looking and seeing everything that he's done and accomplished by his perfect life and his innocent suffering and death, and he's saying, it is finished, that's the way we translate it, and it's proper, but in essence, he's also saying here, perfect. This is done. This is complete. It had to be tough to be an Old Testament priest when you had to go through all the rigmarole, especially as a high priest, to go into the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, and the very special sacrifice that you could only do once a year. And, and um, uh, Pastor Ehlert preached about that about two weeks ago at the First Lutheran Fantastic Sermon. And, and just, it had to be frustrating from all of that with the blood and the essence and everything that you do, and you had to repeat it every year. It wasn't enough. It wasn't intended to be enough. Human deeds, actions, sacrifices, the blood of animals cannot take away the sin of a human soul. But it pointed ahead to the one last perfect, complete sacrifice of our Savior Jesus Christ for all the sins, of all the sinners, and all the world. After he was brought to his goal, he became the source of eternal salvation for everyone who obeys him. Last week, Thursday evening, after I preached at Mount Olive Swamico, I scooted over to the Rush Center. My alma mater, Manitowoc Lutheran High School, girls basketball team was playing in state. It, it was one level uh, below the championships. Their girls team, I don't think, has ever gone that far to state. And my cousin's daughter was playing, so that was kind of exciting to go. Manitowoc Lutheran's girls team really had turned out well this year, gone a lot farther than anybody expected them. And they didn't go into the playoffs at the rest center thinking, well, we got this far, this is pretty amazing, uh, let's pat ourselves on the back. They went in thinking they're going to go all the way and win this thing. <laughs> and they got beaten pretty badly last Thursday. And the team that beat them pretty badly got beaten by another team at state championships last Saturday morning. You see, human beings can have all of our goals, and we can talk about um, excellence and performance and perfection, 
But we can't accomplish that. That's why we turn to our perfect high priest. By his active obedience, fulfilling every one of those laws of God that we haven't and we should have. By his passive obedience, taking upon himself the shame, the punishment for all sins of all sinners in all the world. He came to this earth for the goal. And he accomplished that goal. And in Christ, we are winners with the perfect high priest. God grant this for Jesus' sake. Amen. So may the peace of God, which goes beyond all human understanding, keep our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus, our Savior. Amen.